The Nature Conservancy, live in classrooms around the world to teach how nature works to provide our clean air, water, food, and energy. Learn what you can do to help keep nature healthy and productive. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Eric Delvin. I work at the Nature Conservancy as the director for the Emerald Edge, the area that we're visiting today. Thank you for coming with us today on our virtual field trip made possible with the generous support from Lowe's. Today, we're visiting Clayquot Sound in Canada. It's located on the west coast of Vancouver Island and is part of the area that we at the Nature Conservancy call the Emerald Edge. Sounds beautiful, right? The Emerald Edge stretches from the Washington coast through British Columbia in Canada up to Southeast Alaska. And we call it the Emerald Edge because it's where the largest, the world's largest intact coastal temperate rainforest, over a hundred million acres, sits at the edge of an incredible coastline. The Emerald Edge is home to more than 50 indigenous communities, including Alaska natives, First Nations, and Native Americans who've lived here for millennia. Their cultures and livelihoods are rooted in a connection between people and nature. Our trip today takes place in Clayquot Sound, home to several First Nations communities and some pretty amazing scenery. Let's go there now and see why the Emerald Edge is called one of the greatest living treasures of biodiversity on Earth. <laughs> I am always in awe of this place. There are so many animals and towering trees and the water is so emerald blue. I hope you're as thrilled as I am to go on a tour. I'm excited to introduce you to our guide on today's virtual field trip. Joining us live from the Emerald Edge is Simca Martin of the Tloquit First Nation in Clayquot Sound. Simca, welcome, it's good to see you. We are excited to talk to you today. Can you tell us a little about yourself? Hi, Eric, thank you, it's great to see you too. And hello to everyone watching. I'm excited to show you around my home today. 
As Eric said, my First Nation is Tla'ukoyat. The phrase First Nations describes some of the indigenous or native people of these lands and waters who are descendants of the original inhabitants of North America in what is now known as Canada. That means our families have always lived here. The Tla'okoyat First Nation is one of three First Nations within an area known as Clayquot Sound. And we are one of 14 First Nations within the Nuchanuk culture grouping on the west coast of Vancouver Island. There are over 617 First Nations communities in Canada. This interactive map is color coded to show native lands across North America. You can explore it more by going to the link on screen or in the teacher's guide. Wow, 617, that's a lot. It's fascinating to know there are so many different First Nations. Tell us more about what it's like growing up in Clayquot Sound. Have you always lived there? Yes, I grew up here. Um, when I was a child, my best friend and I would spend a lot of time in the forest and on the beach that surrounds our village. We would play on swings and climb big spruce and cedar trees. Sometimes we would go in separate directions in the woods until we felt just far enough apart and then howl our way back to each other like wolves. The forests are so beautiful and it was really fun to play in them as a kid. Now that I'm an adult, I don't do as much tree climbing. I don't like getting sap all over my clothes, but I still do explore places in my homeland that I've never been to before. A lot of people, like you all watching, visit this area with their families for vacation. It rains a lot here and we have a lot of gray days, but the summer has a lot of sunshine, which is when many people come to visit the area. Thanks, Simka. As you know, I've been to Clickwatt Sound many times, and you're right, there is a lot of rain. Before we learn more, let's take a moment to explore how this virtual field trip works and how you can ask some questions and get involved along the way. In the default view for YouTube, you will find a chat box in the upper right-hand corner. If you're logged into Google, you can enter questions at the bottom of this box. So if you're not already logged in, do so now. And when you have a question, you can type it where it says, say something. If you'd like to pop out the chat box, you can click on the three dots next to the smiley face and select pop out chat. Then you can click on the theater mode icon at the bottom of the video window to enlarge the video. Then move the chat box and the video side by side to view both at the same time. If you think of a good question along the way, just type it in the box and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. All right, ready to have some fun? During our trip today, we're gonna play a game called Nature Spy. We sent your teacher a list of animals that you'll see during today's field trip. Pay close attention. When you see an animal on screen, look for it on your worksheet and check the box of the animal you saw. Now, let's take a moment to introduce our classroom of fourth graders from Susie Fuentes Elementary School in Kyle, Texas. They're going to be helping us out during our trip. Hello, class. Hello. Thanks, everyone. So glad you could join us today. Earlier, I said the Nature Conservancy created the name Emerald Edge to describe this long coastline that stretches all the way up to Alaska. It's actually about 30,000 miles because there are so many islands and inlets. But Simka, can you tell us what your ancestors called this place and how you refer to it? We call it Wahyu, meaning home. Also the word Nuchanush, which is the word for our cultural grouping, translates to all along the mountains and the sea. It's amazing that all that information fits in one word and it's such a perfect description of your home, what it's like. What's it like to live all along the mountains and the sea? It may surprise you that a rainforest is so far north but the mountains and sea here are part of what is called the coastal temperate rainforest. A temperate rainforest just means sometimes it's warm and sometimes it's cool, but it doesn't get really hot or really cold. Whereas in a tropical rainforest, it's hot and humid most of the time. But all rainforests get a large amount of rain, whether they're temperate or tropical. This map shows that a temperate zone is further north, while the tropical zone is further south. 
which is closer to the equator where it's usually warmer. Our average rainfall is around 130 inches per year. To put that into perspective, in Chicago, the average rainfall is only 36 inches per year. That's a big difference. If you're wondering about snow, we get a little bit, but not as much as other places this far north. There are also a lot of rivers, I bet, with all the rain. Is that right? We do have a lot of rivers. They are made from rain and mist and fog or from melted snow that is high up in the mountains. It sends fresh water down the hills and to the lakes. The rivers connect us to the sea in many ways. I want to explain one really unique thing that shows how the land and sea are connected here. In Clayoquot Sound, there are five different kinds of salmon. You might have heard of sockeye salmon, um, but there are also Chinook, Coho, Pink, and Chum. These fish live in both fresh and salt water, and they go from the ocean to the rivers to spawn or reproduce. After they die, or sorry, after they spawn, they die, which might sound sad, but is part of the cycle of life. Their offspring return to the ocean to live, and when the dead salmon break down in the forest, they bring nutrients from the ocean to the land. Their bodies feed the plants and the trees that grow so tall here. It's really amazing to think about the way the land and the sea are connected. Tell us about the importance of salmon in your daily life. Sure. Salmon is an important traditional food for us and as part of our livelihoods. Sometimes our entire community comes together for a meal and smoked salmon is on the menu. We also enjoy steamed clams, crab, potatoes, and salad. And we always have an, a spaghetti option for the picky kids. Other traditional foods include various root vegetables and many kinds of fish, seaweed, berry leaf, teas, elk, deer, and on rare occasions, whale meat and blubber. It's hard to choose a favorite, but I do love smoked wild salmon. That's a lot of different foods. It sounds like you get a lot of the food you eat from around Clayquot Sound. We do. And there are very specific stewardship practices for everything that is gardened, gathered, collected, or hunted. We're very careful about not taking more than we need. In our language, we have the word isak, which can be translated to respect for all living things. And that's at the heart of our practices for stewarding or taking care of the land. Thanks for sharing that, Simka. It seems like a lot of your time is spent on the water in your canoe. Canoes play an important role in your culture too, right? They do. Uh, canoes used to be a main mode of transportation. Since we have so many inlets and islands, canoes were the fastest way to get around and get to them. Being on the ocean in a canoe teaches a lot of important local knowledge like how to work with the tides and the winds and the importance of weather forecasting. Traveling by canoe helps a person get in tune with everything around them. The canoe is experiencing a resurgence today through yearly intertribal canoe journeys where indigenous people from all over paddle from their homes to a different location hosted by an indigenous community in North America. Tell us more about how canoes and canoe carving are part of your family. My dad makes the canoes that I use for my business. He loves making canoes. He learned from his father and he takes a lot of pride in it. And he's made over 70 canoes already. I love being in these canoes. It's peaceful and I feel like I'm part of the world around me. Unlike how I feel in a noisy, fast motorboat. It's such an amazing experience to be out on the water. So let's climb aboard and let me show you what it's like to travel through the sound in a hand carved canoe.
That view from your canoe looks awesome. I bet everyone watching wishes they were there. Being on the water looks so peaceful. Did your father make the canoe we just saw? And can you tell us more about it? Yes, my dad made that canoe. Uh, the trees that he uses to make canoes are anywhere from 300 to 800 years old. He always uses cedar, but I've heard of other carvers uh, using other kinds of wood like Sitka spruce, but it's a bit more difficult to carve and it's a bit heavier. Um, if my dad has leftover wood after making a canoe, he uses it to make tlupchas, which is cedar splints for a traditional salmon barbecue. It can also be used for kindling and sm other smaller carvings. My dad likes to carve also masks, totems, rattles, bent wood boxes. I'll let him tell you a little bit more. My traditional name is Tuta Kwisnefis. I'm from the house of Iwas of Tlaukwet. Um, my English given name is Joel Martin. I learned about canoe carving from my father and my grandfather when I was very young. He didn't leave me a choice to go or not. He just get ready, we're going. When I was really young, I didn't like it. But now I appreciate all I've learned from it. The uh, process of selecting a tree for a canoe was one of the most important steps. And that was because of the teachings of our people to be very respectful of all the creatures around here. This forest here, you can't just come here and just cut a tree down. I had to come here several times and sit here and just listen to be really quiet. Make sure that there's no eagle nests around in any of the trees here, or a wolf den, or a bear den, or a cougar den. The uh, canoe was one of the most important creations of the coastal peoples here because it gave us access to all the resources from the mountains also, and especially from the ocean. You go there and, and go do fishing, hunting. We will take and, and use uh, as much of it as we can. There'll be five canoes made out of this one tree. This tree, when I first cut it down right at the base over there, it's about eight feet in diameter. And so once we cut it down, then we took about nine more feet off of it. This canoe will take maybe 600 hours. Today I use a chainsaw to cut this, but in the former days they just split it all. And it was all done by hand. And the former days was stone, bone and fire that they would use to shape these canoes. And today I do use a chainsaw and some modern tools that I have. I learned carving only because my father and my grandfather didn't give me a choice to go or not. They said, get ready, we're going. <laughs> was do you want to come? <laughs> Somebody told me, get ready, we're going. And that's basically how I learned it. A lot of children, a lot of people will, will learn just from watching. And you know, that's how uh, I learned a lot of stuff, was just by watching. And I learned how to car cut up salmon because I watched my grandmother do it so many times. She was really quick at it. Carved canoes that I learned from my dad and my grandfather. So that's all my dad used was one of these. And these here and those two, that's, that's all I did. The canoes that I have made for my daughters have been used for educating the uh, general public that come here to visit the lands here to see it from our perspective. They would travel in that canoe and be taught about the local history here. The land has been also our teacher and in many, many ways the uh, canoes uh, that evolved here on the coast, they did evolve here for a long, long time. And they did evolve for the many moods of the Pacific Ocean. That's why they have the high end and the bow piece and the stern piece for going through the surf and so on. We came here and uh, made kind of an offering to this land to, to say thank you for having this tree that will give life to our communities. It's a tree that begins a new life and also uh, it's a continuation of a life for our people that will use this vessel once it's carved. That was so cool to see. I love watching the process he goes through to pick out the wood and carve the canoe. And it almost looks like he's carving butter when he's carving, but I'm sure it's harder, harder than that. So tell us more about the canoe tours you give. Can anyone come and take one? Yes, anyone can come on a tour, even people who have never paddled before. Uh, for my business, I spend some time giving tours, but I also train the new guides. 
Being a tour guide helped shape who I am today. It taught me leadership skills, public speaking skills, and so much more. Um, we have all different people visiting Clayquot Sound, so you never know who's going to be sitting in your canoe. I get to meet so many people. It's a pretty good job. During the tours, we teach people how to paddle the canoe and tell them about the land. We also take time to just be very quiet and listen to nature. Think about when you're feeling angry or sad or too busy. If you take a moment to be quiet and breathe, it can make you feel better. Yes, that's very true. It's important for people to take in the beauty of the land and water and understand how important it is to take care of it. Okay, Simka, I bet everyone watching is wondering what types of animals do you see when you're in the canoe? We see different things depending where we paddle. Most commonly, we see birds like eagles, shorebirds, ducks, seagulls, kingfishers, and loons. We also see lots of different kinds of fish swimming beneath the canoe and along the shore. Along the shore, we'll see some cool invertebrates like sea stars, mussels, and barnacles. If we are lucky, we'll see also river otters, harbor seals, sea lions, and porpoises. Wow, I bet people love seeing all those amazing animals. Simka, do you have any other experiences that you would like to share? A couple of years ago in the fall, I went paddle boarding down one of the rivers and didn't, didn't think about it being the salmon run time. The river levels are too low to go down that river in the summer. The fall rains had filled it just enough to paddle board down, but it also made it just right for the salmon who were returning to spawn. I felt bad about disturbing them once I started seeing them. Not only were we spooking the salmon with our shadows, we spooked a few bears who were fishing as well, but really we were all just spooking each other. Even so, it was nice to see everyone gathered there. <laughs> that would be awesome to see bears in nature fishing for dinner. Okay, we've covered a lot so far, so let's pause for a moment and take some questions from some of those who are watching. Here's our first question from Mary Ferguson ask, what does whale meat taste like and what about blubber? Uh, blubber tastes a little bit like uh, shrimp if you've ever eaten shrimp. It's like a different texture, um, but it does have the flavor of shrimp. And the whale meat that I've had um, tasted kind of like beef, but with a little bit more ocean flavor. I don't know how to better describe it than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, some students from Indian Springs want to know, have you ever seen a wild big cat? I actually haven't. Um, they're here, and I'm sure they've seen me, but I haven't seen one yet. Okay, let's switch gears a bit. Earlier, you told us about the word isak which means respect for all living things. Can you tell us more about your language and maybe some of your favorite words? Sure, our language is a little different than how everyone watching might speak. Uh, for example, our language is more action or verb based rather than thing or noun based. A uh, kid might say, we will walk. And we would say, yatsuk with us nish, which translates back as walking will we. Same meaning, but with the emphasis on the action, kind of like the way Yoda talks. <laughs> uh, my favorite words are um, hayu, I hope you can see that. Because of how it sounds, it means 10 in our language. I have a thing for sounds, and it sounds like a wolf howl, hayu. Next one is moo. It is four, and it sounds like a cow. I found that amusing as a kid. Ask a cow how many legs it has and it will answer moo because it's smart and it means four. Uh, next we have hishuk ish tawak, a common expression meaning everything is interconnected, everything is one. This parallels very well to the concept of how an ecosystem is a living organism with the different forms of life being important parts of the whole. Another word I really like is up high. It means friendly and helpful and not afraid to ask for help. It's actually considered 
uh, unfriendly in our culture not to ask for help when you need it. Okay. I like how you remember the word mu means four. That's funny. I know you're also interested in music and storytelling. Do you sing? Yes, I love to sing. I use uh, native language in my songs because putting it into music helps me learn the language. I think music is important and can really bring emotion out in people. I wrote a song in my native language about orcas, or kakawin. It's about appreciating orcas and being grateful for all the teachings that come from them. Sometimes I sing it when I'm out in the canoe with visitors. We have a recording of your orca song. Let's listen. I love, I love that, that song. song. Thanks for sharing it with us. What other stories can you share with us? Ooh, I have a lot. Uh, probably one of my favorites is about Kaya Tsik, a wolf that runs from the forest to the rocks at the shoreline. He leaps from the rocks into the ocean and magically transforms into Kakawin, or Orca. The image of this creature mid-transformation is my family crest. What this means is that everyone in my family has a responsibility to uphold the teachings of the wolf and the orca. These animals are guardians of the land and the sea, and their power is well recognized by my culture. These animals teach us things. They teach us about taking care of each other and about leadership. Here's an example that's easy to understand. Orcas swim in pods. This means that they swim with their families in groups, and they always share food. So even if one orca catches one fish that they could easily eat alone, they are often still observed sharing that fish among their whole family. This is how my family acts too. We are always looking out for one another. My dad told me that when he used to play as a child, he would drop into other people's home in the village and they would always say, feed him, make him eat. It's a simple thing, but generous too. It's the same thing at potlatch celebrations. The host family proudly feeds and takes care of hundreds of people who come. That's like your parents having a dinner party for a hundred of your closest friends and family. That's a lot of food. I'm glad you shared that with everyone watching. It's clear that culture and family is so important to you. I'd like to go back to our classroom in Kyle, Texas. We've talked a lot about culture and family and I'm wondering, can you tell us some things you do with your family and friends, any traditions that mean a lot to you. For me, I love to go backpacking and hiking in the forest with my family. Looks like we have three students that want to share. Let's start with Josh. Um, hi. Every a tradition that my family does is every year my, my two sisters, my mom and my grandma, stay up till midnight on New Year's Eve to welcome the new year. That's great. Our second student is Noah Garganus. Around maybe two, 
once a year, we go to Garner State Park. It is a park with many trails and a river. That sounds fun. And our third student is Baya Green. A tradition that me and my family do is every year we go to my great grandpa's house and we, we this is on Christmas Eve and we have a pie eating contest. We play Mexican bingo and it's just really fun in general. That's great, thank you. Those are great traditions. Thanks for sharing. It's fun to share family traditions and see the unique ways we all celebrate. Earlier, I mentioned that the area, this area at the Emerald Edge, it's considered one of the greatest living treasures of biodiversity. And biodiversity means the variety of life that can be found in a place. In the Emerald Edge, there's a wide variety of plants and animals that live in these magnificent forests and coastal waters. And earlier, you saw some of the animals that live here from Simca's canoe. Let's explore the Emerald Edge a little more and see what else you can find. Make sure you have your nature spy sheet handy and you're gonna wanna use it. So you just saw a lot of bald eagles. They like it here because they're close to open water, there's a lot of fish to eat, and there are big trees for nesting. And it's kind of funny because they aren't actually bald. The name comes from an older meaning of the English word bald, which once meant white, not hairless, like it now does, does now um, mean. If you go on a bear watching tour, it's easy to find black bears, sometimes in the water and sometimes on land. They also tend to live in areas with forests, which is where they gather their food. In the water, you can see orcas or cacaoan, which are magnificent to view up close, especially when you see air and water come up from their blowhole. This means they are breathing. When they exhale or breathe out, they produce a spout of mist, warm air from the blowhole on the top of their heads. And sometimes you'll see seals swimming through the water too. They're really fun to watch. That's really interesting. Can you tell us about the coolest animal encounter you've ever had? Once I had a shy wolf howl back at me. I was in a boat with a group of kids about your age. We had been hiking in our ancestral forest garden and we got a call from someone that a wolf was traveling on the shore nearby us. We went back to our boat and started cruising the shore to see if we could see the wolf. We spotted the wolf walking, moving in and out of the forest along the shore, looking at us warily from about a downtown city block away. She disappeared into the forest and we started to drive away. 
I got this sudden impulse and asked my dad, who was driving the boat, to stop the boat before we got too far. And I just let out this big howl. And we got a beautiful three falling note cascade of a response howl a moment later. That was really special. Wow. So th clearly this is really beautiful place and we've seen and heard a lot of inspirational things about it. That's why I want to talk about the importance of protecting what we see here in the Emerald Edge. Simka, can you talk about some of the environmental challenges faced by your community? Yes, um, logging is a huge issue for us in Clay What Sound. Logging is when people cut down trees to make paper or wood products. When a lot of trees have been cleared from a mountainside, rainwater can wash all the way down with nothing to stop it. This causes erosion of the soil and the rivers get clogged with washed away soil and woody debris. In my native language, the word for tree is suchas, which translates back to English as land holder. Suchas have extensive root systems and a group of suchas working together can hold the soil in place, keeping it from washing away. Logging is a really big concern because it really changes the landscape. There's a big difference between, between taking one tree here and there for what you need and for your community, like a canoe, and cutting massive amounts of trees at one time. I don't think early logging companies understood the importance of the trees or the land. We saw your father talk about taking care to look out for eagle's nest and other animals when selecting a tree to use to make canoes. Can you tell us more about how people from your community take care when finding wood for projects like canoe building? Yes, uh, like my dad said in the video, there are specific stewardship teachings to do with each living being. If someone needs a live standing tree, like for a canoe, there are several things to look for, including eagle's nests and wolf or bear dens. If the dens are too close to your chosen tree or work site, you would be disturbing those animals, which is against our traditional law. It is also against our law to disturb an eagle's nest. If you find a nest in a tree or um, a den that is nearby, you will have to choose another tree. Out of respect for the tree's life, the person cutting down or felling the tree must have a plan for the whole tree. It is important not to cut trees down without a good reason. The person that wants to cut the tree will spend time with it, telling the tree how they would like to transform it into something of great use to their community. Are there any other considerations that must be made before you remove a tree? The tree feller must also look around the area and see uh, which young saplings are there who will come up in that tree's place. The canopy of the forest will open up when the tree falls, the big tree, that is, and more sunlight will reach the forest floor. So it is important to not trample the saplings who will be able to spring up once they are getting more light when that larger tree comes down. I know from the Nature Conservancy's work in Canada that many First Nations like yours are reasserting their rights and authority to manage their lands and waters. And I see why it's important for communities like yours to have a voice in how to protect the lands and waters and be smart about using what nature provides. It also seems like your traditional laws take into account the need to care for the lands and waters on which you depend. You mentioned the word stewardship a few times. Can you explain what stewardship means to you and tell us more about the role of stewardship in your community? Stewardship is the careful and responsible management of something. In my community, we have ancestral stewardship roles that date back thousands of years. We have a river keepers. They keep an eye over the streams and rivers within our territory, and they keep an eye on what's going on with the salmon. Sometimes the young salmon get trapped inside small pools, and if the weather is hot, the pools can heat up um, which is dangerous for the fish. The river keepers move these salmon to the larger pools or to flowing rivers to keep them cool and to save them. Thanks for sharing that, Simka. Those are great, example of why, great examples of why it's important at us at the Nature Conservancy to work to support communities to regain stewardship authority and get it back to indigenous communities. The goal for everyone is to make sure ecosystems are healthy now and into the future while respecting the culture and heritage. 
If communities like Simca's can make decisions about the land, it's a win for everyone and for nature. The Nature Conservancy in Canada also works with kids, just like you in the audience. We bring youth out to explore where they live, and they learn how to take care of the land, and it's up to them to protect the land of their ancestors. I love being involved with the Emerald Edge team because our project and our work is about what's needed for both people and nature in this landscape. We're doing business competitions to help people start new sustainable businesses, working with communities to protect important lands and waters, and helping support youth programs that get school kids out onto the land. Just to name a few things, and there are things that you can do too, to be stewards of the animals and ecosystems around you. Think about living sustainably and using only what you need and cut back on waste and reuse things and of course, recycle. Help keep the natural areas around you clean and free of trash. Buy FSC certified wood products that come from sustainably harvested trees and spread the word and teach others. We also encourage people to visit the Clayquit Sound area and the Emerald Edge. You can boat, canoe, or hike and develop an appreciation for the lands and waters. So we're getting to the end of our virtual field trip. But before we say goodbye, we'd like to take a few more questions from our audience. Okay, our first question comes from Grayson McKinney from Troy, Michigan. And he asked, Simka, have you learned to carve wood from carve a wood from your dad? I've done a little bit of carving with my dad, though I haven't learned to do a canoe all the way from the beginning to the end. Great. Here's another one from Amy Cordry. And she asked Simka, what do you love most about your land heritage? Ooh, that's a tough question to answer. I don't know if I can answer that one. There's so many things. The land and the culture here are totally interconnected. Um, and I love all of it, so it's hard for me to choose something specific. Okay. And then finally, we have Laura Ferger. Uh, students ask, what inspired you to start a canoe tour company? Ah, well, I grew up doing cultural canoe tours. Uh, my older sister at the time ran a cultural canoe tour business, and uh, I really enjoyed working for her because of all the skills that I got to develop doing that. And so um, when she closed her company down, I was inspired to start my company up um, in order to be able to train other young people from New Channel, from my community, to do the job that I once really enjoyed doing. OK, actually, we have one more for you, Simka. A Great. lot of students are asking if if it floods there due to all the rain, uh, do you get a lot of uh, rain all at once? We do get some pretty heavy downpours sometimes, though the amazing thing about uh, the Hitaktlas, the forest ecosystem here, is that um, there's a lot of mosses and lichens and all the roots of the trees and the bushes that soak things up and slow things down. So. It's more common in like heavily paved areas where it rains a lot to get that flooding effect. But here the forest kind of takes care of soaking, soaking it in. And what doesn't get soaked in just goes down the rivers and either into the lakes and into the oceans. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Well, those were great questions. And we can't thank you all for joining. Thank you enough, uh, all of you, for joining us today. And Simka, we really appreciate you joining us as well for our virtual field trip and showing us around your part of the Emerald Edge. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Let's also say thank you and goodbye to Ms. Waite's class at Susie Fuentes Elementary School. Thanks for joining us. Bye. <laughs> Great. And if you want to follow along with Simca's adventures, you can find links to her blog in the Virtual Field Trip Teacher's Guide and if you want to learn more about the Emerald Edge and the work that I do, you can find links and information, videos, and activities in the Teacher's Guide as well. Check us out on the following URL on the screen. And again, many thanks to Lowe's for providing support for today's virtual field trip. Thanks for joining us, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>